Okay, madam. I think we are live. You can uh, you can start off. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. So today's topic uh, is endometrial evaluation in infertility cases. And uh, as we all tend to concentrate more on follicular growth, follicular development, uh, it is equally important for all of us to evaluate the endometrium for the best of the results in infertility. So, uh, sir, we'll be talking about uh, ultrasound evaluation mostly. Uh, over to you, sir. Let's start off. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, one of the most important things which everybody should understand as far as evaluation of endometrium is concerned as is that this is the procedure which almost everybody should be aware about. Okay. This is not a procedure which you can skip in this entire journey. You can't be reliant on other people in this entire journey. And what is simultaneously important for everybody to understand uh, is that when you evaluate the endometrium, you are simultaneously supposed to evaluate the ovaries also. Okay. Evaluation of endometrium and ovaries both should occur simultaneously as a part of your sonoendocrinology, irrespective of your doing IUI, IVF, HRT, modified natural cycles, no matter what you do, you need to do this. Okay. So uh, practically in this lecture, we are going to be focusing more on a normal endometrium. We are not going to be focusing on the abnormalities in the endometrium, like a polyp, fibroid, you know, septum, how all these things will look. We are going to conduct master classes for that separately. Probably this is going to be a short masterclass where I'm going to show, uh, I'm going to draw a diagram in the beginning to start off with and then try to correlate this with a ultrasound picture which we have. And then some tweaks, like how do you approach this entire thing practically? All right. So that is what my, uh, my entire ambition is for this particular class. All right. So I will start the uh, screen sharing. Uh, Shilpa, madam, you be on uh, unmuted. Okay. Okay. Am I audible? Yeah. And can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. All right. So see one of the most important things which we should understand while we are discussing the endometrium is we have the endometrium and we always draw the endometrium in the sagittal plane. Okay. So when we draw the endometrium in the sagittal plane, the evaluation of the endometrium is also going to be in the sagittal plane. If I were to zoom this part of the endometrium for all, for all of you, then it gets divided into something called as a basal layer. Okay. So I will just label this. So both the parts here are your basal layers. Now above the basal layers, okay, is a compact endometrium, which we normally call as a stratum compactum. Okay. But let's not get into all these terminologies of the endometrium. Okay. So this is your compact layer and above the compact layer is your functional layer. This central line here, this central stripe actually represents the union of these two functional layers. Okay. The point where both these guys come and meet, it actually represents that. Okay. What is important for all of us to understand, this is the functional layer. Okay. So I'll just label all of this for everything. Okay. Now, what is important for all of us to understand is that we are trying to predominantly look at a hypoechoic endometrium. Okay. That means it is going to appear absolutely black when it is in the follicular phase or under the effect of estrogen. Just put it that way. All right. And we are trying to look at this entire thing getting hazy. Okay. Whenever it enters inside the secretory phase. And this hazy endometrium or secretory endometrium as we call it is going to be estrogen plus progesterone effect. Okay. So this is something which we have to keep in our mind. Our poor embryo is going to go and get implanted in the secretory endometrium somewhere here. Okay. As a result of which the compact layer is very important because implantation occurs in the compact layer of the endometrium. The functional layer is the one which supplies all the nutrition. Okay. And 
all of this endometrium then has blood vessels which are coming right up to the center and when these blood vessels come right into the center we evaluate that as you know the endometrial flow which we can give a multiple type of scoring inside that but i'll probably try and make it very simple all right what typically happens is at the beginning once a pregnancy has failed to occur okay there is something like this the entire thing gets shedded off and only the basal endometrium survives along with the basal endometrium what is going to live is a part of the compact endometrium and when you have a part of the compact endometrium which is surviving your endometrial thickness goes down drastically at the beginning of the menses which is why on typically day 2 3 4 of menses you have a thin stripe of endometrium which is going to typically measure less than 3 mm or less than 4 mm in size okay now typically this will go till approximately 5 mm in size or up to 6 mm in size and it will be a thinned out endometrium this is predominantly till the follicle is approximately 12 mm usually when the follicle is 12 mm the estradiol value is less than 100 as we have studied in the menstrual cycle there is an e2 peak which occurs following this e2 peak there is an lh surge this e2 peak is absolutely mandatory for the lh surge to occur so this is this e2 peak which pushes the estradiol value to approximately 200 it has to be sustained for approximately 36 to 40 hours and it is this estradiol peak which then causes the endometrium to go from 5 to 6 mm to approximately 7 to 9 to 10 mm where the follicle goes from approximately 16 mm to 19 mm this correlation is very very important for us to understand because remember what typically happens is if you are trying to look at a natural cycle the follicle will become approximately 12 mm by around the 9th day of the cycle and the follicle becomes approximately 18 mm by around the 13 15th day of the cycle okay so this growth of around 1 to 1.5 mm in the follicle is absolutely important for this e2 peak to occur and this is complete physiology based on this growth itself okay once this lh surge occurs slightly before this lh surge you have a small rise in progesterone that is due to the luteinization which occurs as a part of lh receptors developing inside the follicles inside the granulosa cells which we described in the two cell two uh you know inside the two cell two cell two gonadotropin theory you can go to that master class and it is this peak of progesterone okay which occurs which causes the beginning of secretory changes to occur inside the endometrium okay which is going to occur at this 19 mm size slightly before the lh surge okay as a result of this when you see an endometrium which is just about to become slightly hazy you should suspect that this particular progesterone has risen okay and from there on the endometrium starts getting the secretory changes in a natural cycle which is your correlation to everything else okay so now i will switch to a simple video to just after understanding this entire physiology i will switch to a very nice simple video on the actual method of doing this doing this entire technique so as you can see we always try to study this let me play the audio if it's playing is the audio playing no only you are speaking okay so this entire thing uh, endometrium is studied in the mid sagittal plane as you see okay now whenever we try to study this endometrium in the mid sagittal place as you can notice one of the things you should do is you should zoom and then freeze so you have the outer wall of the basal endometrium there okay you have the outer wall of the basal endometrium there you have the rest of the endometrium which is hypoechoic which is present everywhere out there and you have this beautiful thick echogenic stripe in the center where two layers of endometrium are meeting each other remember endometrial cavity is a closed cavity from the part which you visualize to be the widest part go from the outer basal endometrium till the outer basal endometrium very simple okay outer to outer from the part which you think is the thickest remember millimeter wise there can be certain differences between the observers but grossly a thin endometrium will be a thin endometrium and a normal endometrium will be a grossly normal endometrium irrespective of the observer never ever finish it here lot of people add this lot of people add a color doppler through a window 
it's always better to add a power Doppler. Okay, so you can see this. We have added the power Doppler here and you can see some amount of vascularity which is reaching inside the endometrium. It is at least reaching the basal endometrium at a lot of places. Okay, we almost always when we are assessing, this is a live video of the assessment. So we will, after we finish the power Doppler assessment, we would do it one to two times. It is also important to understand Okay, that it has to be a zoomed in image. You can see this Doppler coming inside uh, the endometrium. You know, a lot of times what typically happens here is that because this is not a 3D picture, that particular plane, the vascularity might not be coming in, but the vascularity might be coming in at a separate plane. Okay, which is a plane which you have not picked up. So a 3D assessment with the Doppler is also something which is to be done. But before doing that, we will take a 3D stripe uh, of the endometrium. We can play it dynamically. You can see the acquisition has been done. And once it is acquired, you can see the whole cavity from one cornu to the other cornu by just swiping the region of interest. Okay. If you just swipe your ROI, you will see the cavity from one end of the cornu till the other end of the cornu. Here, the cavity seems to be absolutely perfect to me. I'm just showing that movement. You will just see that. See one cornu I can see there, beautifully seen. I'm going on to the other cornu and I can see the other cornu. So both the cornu seems to be absolutely good. I have swiped through the entire cavity on 3D. Both the cornu are fine. Endometrium is fine. One more add-on test which we do as a standard protocol is once you add the power Doppler, PRF settings are reduced to less than 0 0.3. Okay. And you start the acquisition in 3D. See, now the plane has changed slightly and you can see slightly more vascularity coming in. The important thing is when you are acquiring this 3D Doppler of this entire thing, it is going to be a slow acquisition process because it is going to calculate the Doppler acquisition throughout the contour of the uterus. Try to keep your probe very steady because you don't want any disturbances which are coming inside your field as a part of measurement of this endometrium. Now you can see we are demonstrating that endometrium and you can see some beautiful vascularity when you just screen through this entire endometrium through different contours on all the three axes entering right inside the center. So this is something which is a very healthy endometrium. If I just zoom in this image, it is a very healthy endometrium. Now beyond this, we don't go into the depth of assessment of each and every vessel here, right? What is the RIPI of this vessel and what is the peak systolic velocity of the flow which is entering inside? We normally don't do this. Okay. And even if it is an assessment to be done prior to embryo transfer, prior to starting progesterone in this case, see what we have done. Once we have finished the uterus, we will go to one ovary. Ovary appears to be quiescent. Okay. This has very important for you to establish. Second ovary is quiescent. There is no follicle more than 12 millimeter. And you can expect here that the progesterone value is going to be turning out to be less than one in a situation like this. And in a situation like this, you are going to have an estradiol value, which is going to be approximately more than 150 to 200. Now, over the last three to four days, the commonest questions which we have been asked on our WhatsApp groups from people is that, you know, estradiol value is 180, but progesterone is 0 0.8, but the endometrium is a beautiful triple line hypoechoic. Can we start progesterone? See, this estradiol which you are measuring is an estradiol which is generated inside the blood. And unless you have your own pathology laboratory where you can process this through an estradiol kit and the report is available within two hours, what typically happens is estradiol is a very, very sensitive assay. So by the time you collect the blood, you spin, you create the serum out of it. The collecting guy comes to your hospital, takes the collection sample, goes to his hospital, runs it, keeps it sensitive to the temperature, processes it, do a, does a QAQC and gives you a report. Even if he is in the next building, okay, it is going to take you approximately five to six hours. Okay. But we normally tell people that the best value is estradiol more than 250 to 300, progesterone less than one for you to start patient on any form of progesterone because that ensures that that progesterone peak has not occurred. And if that progesterone peak has not occurred, you are going to be able to have a beautiful synchrony of the embryo and the endometrium. It is the most important thing for people to realize. All right. The secretory changes, the vacular changes, 
which occur due to that peak of progesterone, they start from the compact layer and they go on progressively increasing towards the functional layer of the endometrium as a result of which when your patient comes for embryo transfer, you see the endometrium, which is completely sort of white. Okay. And this white endometrium is due to complete secretory changes inside the endometrium. A lot of people would want to measure progesterone on a completely secretory endometrium going by the study that, you know, if the progesterone values are more than 25 on the day of implantation, you can have an excellent implantation. But now remember, it also depends on which type of progesterone you are using. Okay. It is very, very important for you to understand that. If you are using Dufastone, which is, which is, di, which is a retrogesterone, okay, just try and giving the patient simple Dufastone as a part of your embryo transfer protocol. And you will understand in this entire thing that when you do this alone, your progesterone values will be 2, 8, 7, 10, something like that. The reason why that why it occurs is because the mechanism in which dufastone gets absorbed and then processed in the body is completely different than the mechanism in which any natural micronized progesterone gets absorbed and processed. Simultaneously, if you give IM injections of depot progesterone, you are going to find that when you have given an IM injection, the value of progesterone is more than 50. Okay. Quite a lot of times you will see value more than 100 in these situations. Okay. So there is a lot of discrepancy in the type of HRT uh, progesterone support, which you are going to use. A lot of people use combinations. There are people who use combination of vaginal tablet plus do first one plus injectable. In that situation, your value of progesterone in the serum is going to be abnormally high. Okay. In that particular situation, you will have no clinical correlation of the progesterone values. Should you be wanting to assess the progesterone, you should only and only and only assess progesterone on the day of transfer if you have done a total natural cycle. Okay. You have not given any luteal phase support to the patient. It is a total natural cycle which has been followed. Corpus luteum has been formed and this corpus luteum is causing a serum progesterone value of more than 25. Yes, in that situation, it is considered to be an adequate value. For all other practical purposes, it is not a very adequate value. A lot of times people ask this question repeatedly, despite taking master classes on it, that how many minimum number of days of estrogen should we give? We have cleared it off multiple times that the minimum number of estradiol, which you should be administration, administrating to the patient, should be at least more than eight days. Any value, any number of days lesser than that is going to increase the risk of this breakdown endometrium, first trimester bleeding, reduced pregnancy rates and higher uh, loss of early pregnancies. Okay. So keep that in your mind. I think with this, I finished the basic assessment of the normal endometrium because that is all what we are going to talk about in this session. And I will open the session to Dr. Shilpa for asking questions. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Simon. That was uh, a really good presentation with uh, the basics of uh, endometrium. Uh, so I will uh, just ask you this. Uh, when you assess the endometrium, there are three parameters that you assess. One is the thickness, the second one is the morphology, and the third one is the vascularity. So yeah. among these three, what uh, would you give more importance or do you take equal give equal consideration to all the three? See, honestly, uh, our logic, no, our head will always tell us to give more importance to the thickness. Yes. Okay. Logic. This is simple logic. If it is a, if it is an endometrium, which is eight to nine millimeters, it is a good endometrium. Your morphology is going to be dependent on which plane you are measuring it in. See, endometrium is a very big plane. Okay. And you are taking one cross section of that sagittal endometrium in a 2D and trying to measure it in that particular plane. So if the endometrium has slightly poor morphology in that plane, it doesn't mean that it has a poor morphology in the plane besides it. Okay. So morphology probably then should be given second importance. And when you then study the vascularity, you should understand that if this is the endometrium, the blood vessels come in this direction. It is circumferential vascularity. The arborization occurs perpendicular to the endometrium, right? It is not going to be mandatory that it is 90 degrees. This perpendicular arborization can be 80 degrees also. Other plane can be 60 degrees also. Okay. As a result of this, you should put a Doppler, but you should not be reliant on the Doppler that, oh, Doppler is very poor. I will not do uh, embryo transfer. No, there should, it should not be that type of a criteria. I know a lot of people who spend hours and hours trying to calculate score 
is it coming up to zone 3 is it coming up to zone 4 is it coming up to zone 5 they will kill each other okay between zone 3 zone 2 and zone 5 now remember you can kill there is no problem in dying for an endometrium but but it is extremely observer dependent this entire thing is extremely observer dependent don't go by that impression that what is going to happen when you know i measured something and it has turned out to be zone 4 and if vismay measured something it has turned out to be zone 3 so from tomorrow morning ask vismay to resign no it's really not like that as long as there is vascularity which is entering inside the endometrium you should be happy finished keep it very simple and practical Okay, if in case you add masala to all these things, what is the peak systolic velocity of the vessel which Vismay saw? Ah, he is measuring and it is coming to 6, milli, 6 centimeter per second. Cut 1000 rupees from his salary. Because when I measured, it was 10 centimeters. Look, this is a vessel which is a very tiny vessel. It also depends on the size of your calipers and how nicely the calipers are arranged. What is the angle of insonation? There is no point getting into these many details in order to enhance your success rate by that 1%. I do understand every percentage of success rate in IVF is extremely important. I don't deny that. I am unfortunately, I am also an IVF consultant. Okay. But it is important for people to understand this concept that it, it should be given importance, but it is not something on which you kill each other. Okay. There are so many other reasons to kill people. Why, why, why on a Doppler? Right. Yeah, Shilpa Madam, next one. Thanks. So, do you do endometrium volume, the cavity volume duty? Not always, only in patients who are operated previously. Previous septal resection, previous thin endometrium, previous Asherman, uh, you know, all these cases. But not for routine cases, Madam. Okay. See, when you... Uh, uh, so, we, uh, it's okay. I'll ask it in uh, that session. This is normal endometrium, right? So, so yeah. do you do ED Doppler routinely? No, as a part of this protocol for all patients undergoing embryo transfer, this, this video which we showed you right now, this is the exact same video everybody will follow. So all of them will have a 3D Doppler done, okay, prior to doing the embryo transfer. It is just given as a printed image, but nothing beyond that. Okay. We don't do the vocal. We don't apply vocal software over that particular Doppler. We don't do that. You don't do that? No, we don't do that. We don't do that for practical purposes. Otherwise, madam, there can be a lot of confusion which can happen. Yeah. So maximum implantation potential. I mean, do you mark it uh, uh, on the endometrium before that? No. Time? Once you put the embryo inside the endometrium, it is not going to follow your instructions. It is not going to be that I will be here only. Thank you so much. No. Embryo is a dynamic thing. The fluid which is generated inside the endometrium will push the embryo from one part to the other part. Okay. So there is no point marking anything like that. Okay. So do you do uterine artery Doppler to decide on the dosage of gonadotrophins? We know that you do a lot of standardization. You don't no, uh, no, no. no, no, no. And uh, the endometrium uh, morphology, do you grade it as grade A, grade B, grade C and uh, make a note of it on the case paper and... Uh... No, madam. No, no. It is a good endometrium or a poor endometrium. Finished. Uh, what is your cutoff uh, for the embryo transfer, the thickness? We try to have an endometrial thickness more than 7 millimeters. That is the best thing to do. Okay. But there are so many people in whom the triple line is absolutely beautiful. And even after giving additional estrogen, it refuses to cross 6.5, 6.3, 6.2 millimeters. For that particular lady, if it continues for one cycle more, yeah, understanding. So the first cycle, if it is with HRT, second cycle, she will be on MNC. That is modified natural cycle. And if that cycle also, it is 6.5 only. Okay. Then we will go ahead with the transfer. Because for that lady, that is the normal endometrium. Okay, so you have an endometrium of uh, say 8 millimeter, but uh, grade 3 flow. You have an yeah. endometrium of 6.5 millimeter, but with grade 4 flow. So which one, uh, in your opinion, will have a better outcome? Both will have equally poor outcomes. Okay, the, yeah, same outcomes. I don't mean poor. Both will have equally same outcomes. It then comes down to what is the age of that patient and what is the embryo morphology of that patient. So, as I said, do not just put that endometrium alone and then come to a conclusion. Unfortunately, endometrium has to be correlated with the follicle. So, when I say the follicle, it means the age of the patient. All right. And then with the grade of the embryo. So, with uh, in HRT cycles, with uh, estradiol valerate, 
compared to estradiol hemihydrate do you see difference in the morphology and the thickness in the endometrium no okay, okay. and uh, between like say mnc cycle with letrozole or with hrt do you see difference in the vascularity or morphology uh, when the e2 is around the same level say like uh, 250 or definitely for a in hrt cycles for a much higher e2 you will have a slightly poor vascularity in a modified natural cycle for let's say you have done a modified natural cycle by stimulating the patient on letrozole i'm just giving an example okay so you've given 5 days of estradiol the uh, i mean sorry 5 days of letrozole the e2 value will be 85 let's assume but the vascularity will be zone 4 understanding mm. so it has got no problems okay so someone is asking lateral metroplasty will it improve endometrial blood flow we will discuss that on a session on lateral metroplasty. I'll take a proper session on it. Don't worry. Okay. What is this apple bomb classification? I don't know. Don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So do you do progesterone values on the day of uh, embryo? You said uh, you do it only in purely natural cycle. In HRT cycle? No, no. It is the best to do it in purely natural cycles. Uh, okay. In HRT cycles, it depends on the type of progesterone which you are using. If you are using Dufastone alone, the progesterone values will rarely exceed 10 to 12. Okay. Mm. If you are using, let's say, injectable progesterone alone, you will rarely have a value less than 80. Yeah. If you are using just vaginal uh, gels, your values of progesterone will be around 25 to 28. Okay. Now, it really depends. All are good. But it depends on what you have used, right? And as a result of this, probably it does not have a very significant role apart from documentation purposes. So below which you think uh, you should not go ahead with the transfer? Four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So someone is asking, Sildenafil, will it help in thickening the endometrium? I don't know. I have never used it in my career so far. Yeah. Yeah. I think we uh, we have finished my questions and uh, all the ones which are in the chat box. So we'll take the rest uh, uh, on the WhatsApp groups. Okay, madam. No problem. Thank, thank you so much. You. Thank you very much. It was wonderful.